Devel Morrison of Bossley Real Estate, a regular contributor here at Toronto this weekend, joins me now for our weekly real estate check-in. Hey, Devel. Hey, Maggie. How are you? Good. Are you wearing your fascinator and drinking tea and eating crumpets this morning and watching the coronation? No, I don't care. <laughs> okay. Tell us how you really feel, Devel. Okay. You know what? If, if it were Prince William, I'd be like all in. I'd be like so excited about it. Yeah. But Charles, Camilla, eh. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's fair. You're allowed to not care. <laughs> <laughs> We're happy to have you here. All right. Uh, let's talk about there's so much news in real estate this week. Um, interesting story that came across our, you know, the headlines this week. It, those in the shelter system who cannot afford to rent in the city might not receive the financial help they need to get off the street. So the Canada Ontario housing benefit, which I didn't even know existed. So I, you know, Quite pleased to hear that we have something like this, first of all. Um, so it's designed to help bridge the cost in rent for those who have experienced homelessness. Uh, and they'll, you know, so they, they kind of get a helping hand to be able to, you know, they might not have enough funds to be able to rent a home um, and or rent an apartment. And so the government helps them in order to bridge that gap. So they will receive uh, millions less in funding this year, which will help 500 less people than last year. I don't understand this. Why are we cutting back on this service, which inevitably helps our city, right? You get homeless people off the streets, you get them into yeah. apartments and homes that takes care of, you know, the issues that we've seen on TTC, the, you know, the issue that we've seen on our streets. I just don't understand why the government is cutting back on this Devel. Yeah, I agree. I, 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 yeah, I couldn't agree more. It makes no sense to me. I'm like, this is not the time to be cutting back on a program that works that is actually helping people. It, it, it's counterintuitive, really. I mean, we have a homeless crisis. Everybody knows it. Let's actually do something about it. So if they've got a program that works, they should absolutely be sticking with it and probably increasing it at this point, not cutting it back. Yeah. And I think my biggest concern is that 500 less people will be helped. So then what happens to these people? You know, we've heard from a number of people who work within the shelter system saying that they cannot keep up with the demands. Mm -hmm. They've had to turn away uh, people every single year because they just don't have enough beds. And again, to your point, you know, if we have a system that's working, that's getting people off the streets. But even more, you know, last week we heard that the Economic and uh, Community Development Development Committee is recommending that the city that city council declare homelessness a problem in the city um, and create and as an emergency in the city. Um, right. And so if this is could be considered an emergency, does it feel to Val, like people keep passing this off? The levels of government keep passing off this issue. Absolutely. And I mean, declare it an emergency now because it wasn't an emergency two years ago yeah. or three to go or I mean it just seems like of course it's an emergency why wasn't this done years ago yeah but no I don't think that we do take this seriously and I would say I don't think our mayoral candidates take this seriously really? either really because I feel like well, everybody's been talking about it everyone talks about housing yeah but I'm not sure that you know when they talk about homelessness I feel like that's different than housing mm -hmm. you know right. because we are at at this sort of really critical juncture, really, when it comes to the homelessness issues that we face in the city. Yeah. Now, I would say, too, I mean, I, I do travel a lot and I'm noticing this issue all around the world. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to solve it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not something that's just Toronto's dealing with. But I do think that we need to put our heads together and figure out a way through to fix this because... People need a place to live. They just do. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. Sometimes we get affordable housing mixed up with the homeless problem in the city. You're right. And and you can almost see think that both are the same, but they are very, very different. And uh, we have to make sure that that is something that, that the candidates are talking about. 73 of them, by the way. 73 candidates <laughs> right now. Devel, are you on the list? Are you running? It's funny. So my stepdad put his hand in the ring to run. Oh, okay. yeah. So my, my stepdad is Glenn Benway and he has decided to run for mayor because he was so upset with the uh, what he was seeing as other people running for mayor 
that he has put his hand in. And right. there's a little uh, mayoral debate happening uh, in June Rollins Park, yeah. uh, run by Apple Tree Markets uh, in the Young and Eglinton area today at around 2.30, where mayoral candidates will be there introducing themselves to people. So, you know, good luck to everybody going out there today. Okay. All right. Uh, in other news, Ontario Ombudsman Paul Dubé has said that the Landlord Tenant Board is unequipped to deal with the backlog of over 38,000 applications. Dubé has said that this isn't solely a problem that we have seen come out of the pandemic, but this is a structural problem as well. Do you agree? Oh, yeah. I mean, this this landlord tenant board has been a problem for years. And I mean, maybe people are only just waking up to it. But I mean, the, the report is that there's 38,000 cases in the queue. Yeah. I mean, imagine if you're a landlord and your tenant is not paying rent, it might take you up to a year to even get heard and get money out of anybody. Gosh. That's a year of you paying your mortgage that your bank doesn't say, Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Landlord, you, or Mr. And Mrs. Landlord, you don't need to pay your mortgage because your tenant is not paying your their rent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there are also cases of tenants who are living in horrible conditions, and their landlords are not taking care of those conditions that are also, you know, have their cases. So both sides, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Are, <laughs> Thanks for putting me in there, Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, just sort of trying to make it fair here. Um, but absolutely, but you, both you sides. Know, one of the issues that I thought was interesting, I was actually watching a program about this. The technology issues are a huge issue. So, hmm. what they were saying is, right now, the cases are all getting adjudicated online. They're all right. on Zoom, right? But right. if you're a tenant with a, a not a huge cell phone plan, yep. you get stuck on hold for hours. Yep. And you know, I'm going to say most landlords probably have a laptop, so they're just sitting on their laptop waiting. But if you're on a phone and you don't have a huge cell phone plan, and it takes hours to get your case heard, and basically your your phone runs out of juice, yeah, that doesn't really work. Yeah, that just seems you so know? archaic. Right. Like, why are you waiting? Why why aren't you given a time? And this is when you show up. Yeah. Or like, it just seems archaic. Some of the other points that um, Paul Dubé had pointed out, uh, again, the Ontario Ombudsman is that there's a shortage of qualified adju- adjudicators uh, made worse by lengthy appointment and training processes, a complicated application process that could be appended uh, by simple clerical errors, um, antiquated systems, so kind of what you were saying as well, that failed to triage uh, urgent cases, and a lack of bilingual adjudicators uh, as well, adjudicators as well. So, um, you know, just there's a number of issues that need to be dealt with. Yeah, no, there really are. And I mean, it, it is critical as we talk about housing is an urgent need. Yeah. So this is definitely something that, you know, should be a priority. But quite frankly, I feel like the whole landlord tenant board, the Residential Tenancies Act, they need to scrap it and start again because yeah. it's not working. There needs to be an overhaul. And I'm happy to see that Paul Dubé is actually, you know, even just to be aware of that and say, OK, how do we move uh, forward from this? So, Devel, I find this, uh, this is another, uh, you know, headline that we saw this week in the world of real estate. According to the Globe and Mail, only 385 households in Toronto, Vancouver and Victoria have used the first time home buyer incentive. And this is over a three year span. First of all, maybe if you can explain what is the home buyer incentive, because essentially it's supposed to help first time home buyers get on their feet and be able to buy a home, correct? Yeah, it is, but it's very, it was very, it was rushed to market and it's very ill thought out. So that the way it works previously was that households with a max of $120,000 were allowed to borrow up to four times that amount, okay. um, which would amount to something like $480,000. And so the most expensive house that one could buy would be $505,000. Mm-hmm. Now, as we all know, in Toronto and Vancouver, I'm not exactly sure what that's going to buy you. Yeah. Perhaps a parking spot? Yeah. Um, And then, you know, for Toronto, so then what they did is they upgraded it. So people in Toronto, Vancouver, and Victoria, it was tweaked to a maximum income of $150,000. So they could borrow about four to five times that. So they could buy a home with a max of $722,000. Wow. Yeah. Certainly is much better, but I mean, at the first go at five hundred and five thousand, I mean, come on. Yeah. 
So, I uh, mean, no, go ahead. Even, even Toronto, I mean, set a, leave, leave aside Toronto and Vancouver, the house prices across the country are so expensive. I'm not sure exactly what people are buying for 505000 There are definitely some small markets where you can do justice with that funds, with those funds, but there's a lot of markets where that just does not work. Yeah. No, I, I could understand what the government is doing, but, and, you know, could appreciate that they're trying to help, but it's, it is, it, it does not sound realistic. So apparently across the country, there have only been a little over 17,000 people who have actually taken, um, you know, actually um, access this first time home buyer incentive. So you would think that would say to the government, okay, maybe this isn't working and maybe mm-hmm. we need to continue to tweak this. Yeah, but, you know, I think the challenge is, is when the government, and I would say many levels of government here, when they come up with housing policies, they seem to sit in a vacuum with themselves Mm. to come up with bright ideas. They tend not to seem to consult with anyone who works in the mortgage industry, anyone who works in the real estate industry. And they probably need to do that to come up with better policies that are going to work. Yeah. Have you You know, I think that... I think that's the challenge, right? Yeah. So, you know, with this particular program, the government contributes, let's say, 10% um, to somebody's down payment, but it also, and so it helps to reduce their monthly mortgage payment, w- payments, which is great, but it now means that the government takes 10% of your equity when you go to sell. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And some people would be like, okay, I'll do that in order to just get into the market. But if this is not yeah. even helping people break into, again, you know, and the average house in Toronto is what, 1.1, 1.2 million? Like, yeah. I mean, this is not anywhere close to that. Have you ever run across any of your clients who are interested or even know about this? Because, again, I don't know of many people that would even know about this first time home buyer incentive. I mean, I know a number of people who, you know, got into the market last year and they didn't know about this. Yeah, no, of course. No, most people don't know about it. And it's not something that I've explained to clients because at $505,000, you're not doing anything. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, Rob Davis, who is a former city councillor and one of the 73 people running for mayor of Toronto, announced this week that if elected, he would sign a bylaw banning Airbnbs and releasing 20,000 rental units. Does this make sense? Is this realistic to you? No, it's completely short sighted. You know, the reality is, is that if you stop somebody from renting out their unit on Airbnb, they are not going to all of a sudden turn it into a long term rental. Yeah. And, you know, we just discussed about the issues with the landlord tenant board. And that is all linked. You know, for many people who want to become long term landlords, they see all those issues with the LTB and how long it takes to get a case heard. And it makes them back away from the thought of being a long-term landlord. The laws right now are heavily in favor of tenants. And for many landlords, they feel they want more control over the property they own. And that's why they turn to renting their place on short-term rentals. So, you know, this is ill thought out, I would say, by Rob Davis, because it's really not going to solve any problems. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think the key is the long term, right? I mean, the flexibility. I I know a couple of people that have Airbnb Airbnb, uh, properties and just, you know, the fluidity of being able to then put it up uh, and then, you know, and then if they want to use the property, they can and not Mm -hmm. having to have, again, the pressure and the onus of running a long term uh, rental facility that scares a lot of people. Right. And Absolutely. the cost of that, which, you know, well, because that's what you do. Yeah, no, exactly. Like I do have Airbnb rentals as well, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other thing, too, is that when I travel, I like to stay in Airbnbs. And that's because I like to have my own kitchen. Yeah, I want to look, I want to go to the grocery store. I want to live like a local. And so for many people, that's why they turn to Airbnb or VRBO or any of the other short-term rental platforms is because they want to live like a local. They don't want to be in a hotel where, you know, they're forced to eat out for every breakfast and every lunch. So, you know, that Airbnb, those short-term rentals provide a service that people actually want when they're traveling to a new city. Yeah. And, I, you know, like we were, were thinking of traveling this summer. And the first thing I did was I went to Airbnb. 
uh, you know, yeah. to my app and I was checking out and, and I couldn't find something. And my husband's like, why don't you check a hotel? I'm like, oh yeah, hotels still exist because <laughs> everywhere I travel, I always, I always get an Airbnb, right? It just becomes the natural thing. And I think even more like, I, I just wonder how about how restrictive that could be to people who like you and I love to go to Airbnbs if we shut that down in our city. Again, we're Absolutely. talking about Toronto. We're talking about a global city and not exactly. having the accessibility to Airbnb would be would be short sighted for our city as well and the availability for our city. Uh- Absolutely. And we can't also, we have to remember that the, those Airbnbs are a revenue source for the city of Toronto. Yes. That, you know, p- the, everyone who owns an Airbnb in Toronto is kicking in a municipal accommodation tax, which used to be 4%, which re- recently got hiked to 6%. Mm-hmm. And so Rob Davis is also forgetting that this is a source of revenue for the city of Toronto. And at this point, as we've seen, they have budget issues. They need every source of revenue they can get. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, good on Rob for think trying to think outside the box, but I think we just need to take this back to the whiteboard and maybe iron it out a, a little bit more. Um, okay. It, big news in the communications world this week. Rogers cut the price of most of its fastest cell phone plans on Thursday and is offering new deals for bundling wireless uh, with home internet service. This is all after Rogers announced uh, that they would be acquiring Shaw. Um, Do you feel like there's a war brewing? Like we are going to start seeing more competition when it comes to the wireless world in Canada? Because I actually get excited about hearing things like this. Absolutely. I mean, let's hope because really they're saying that, you know, across the world, Canadians are paying a lot more for their cell phones than other countries are. So, hey, if there's now an economies of scale for Rogers now that they've taken over Shaw and they can offer us a discount. Awesome. My only concern is, are they just offering it or do I need to pick up the phone Mm. and sit on hold and beg for it in order to get it yeah (laughs) that's what I don't like yeah yeah it sounds like it's it's a cross but you're right I mean there could be some you know layers to that maybe some red tape I just I'm wait I'm I'm not with Roger so I'd be waiting to see what Telus and Bell and the other companies do and if they bite at this because I could see a lot of people you know, transferring over to Rogers if they're going to get a serious cut in uh, in their cell phone plan. I'm sure all the others will t- follow suit, right? Like this will just lead to better pricing for all Canadians, which is great. But, you know, like I said, I feel like I'm now going to have to call. I, I am a Rogers customer. Yep. I'm going to have to pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, where's my discount? Yeah. I want it. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was listening to Toronto this weekend and apparently I should be getting a discount. That's what you should say. Um, <laughs> all right. Loblaws saw a 10% increase in profits for its first quarter. Uh, Interesting, interesting. Loblaw uh, also reported a profit of $418 million in its first quarter, down uh, from $437 million last year. Uh, But this, you know, again, we we saw Galen Weston testify in front of the committee. Uh, We Mm -hmm. heard him say that most of the profit has come from, you know, Joe Fresh and shoppers and their other entities, not from food, uh, from groceries. Thoughts on this? Yeah, it's funny because, I mean, every week we really do talk about groceries. Right? Because it's a thing. (laughs) Because everybody is grocery shopping. Yes. I guess I'm not buying any of this. I'm like 10% profit increase. They've increased how much money they're paying in dividends to their shareholders. Mm -hmm. You know, I just think back to the pandemic when the only thing that was open was grocery stores and everybody was grocery shopping. These guys made money hand over fist. And it's clear because there's a profit and there's more dividends. And they're paying their CEO more money. I'm like, not so fast. Why don't you drop some prices? Maybe stop charging your partner so much money. Maybe stop paying your CEO so much money. Maybe increase the wages of the cashiers. Yeah. Let's see it spread out. Let's see the wealth spread out a little bit more. Later yeah. on in the show, we're going to talk to Ed Keenan. And apparently the government is looking at creating a code of conduct when it comes to grocers. Uh, so that will be interesting. We'll, we'll be chatting with Ed a little bit more about that story. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how that trickles down to, you know, you and I, Devel, who, again, shopping and just seeing the price increase. Uh, with this code of conduct. Fascinating. Thanks so much, Devel. Thanks for having me.